My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. It seems like here uh, lately, the last several messages that I've preached, it's about hurting or something like that. And, and you say, why? And, and that's just what God is putting upon my heart at this time. And so I want to be obedient to God. And I, I do believe that there are probably far more people hurting and needs our support and encouragement than maybe sometimes we realize. And so I think that obviously the body of Christ, the church, should be a place where Christians can receive that encouragement that they, that we all, uh, from time to time, so desperately need. You've heard it said, you're either in a storm or you're coming out of a storm or you're getting ready to go into a storm. I don't want to be pessimistic, but that's just realistic. That is just life. And so we need to be able to, to see it and understand it as best we can from a heavenly perspective. Because if we look at our storms just from an earthly perspective, it can be very overwhelming. It can be very discouraging. And maybe we even at times maybe think that God is against us or that God has left us. And so therefore, even as I prayed a moment ago, we need to, I think we have to go back to the Word of God. This is one of, when you're in a storm, when you're going through a hard time in your life, it is definitely one of those times that you cannot lean upon your own understanding. Because if you look at it purely from a human perspective, uh, unless you're a whole lot better than I am, it will get you down pretty quickly. And so you have to be able to go back to the Word of God. And sometimes you don't want to go back to the Word of God, right? Let's just be real here. Sometimes you're going through the storm, you really don't want to go, or you really don't want to pray. But you have to do those things. If you want to have the victory and you want to have the strength and to be able to go through the storm, you have to go back to truth and you have to go back to God and, and find his strength to help carry you through and see you through the storm. If I could summarize my entire sermon into one sentence and all of God's people said, amen, you know, let me, let me do that. Here's one sentence. God has a very special plan and purpose for each of our lives and he works relentlessly to cause that plan and purpose to come to pass let me say it to you again God has a very special plan and purpose for each of our lives and he works relentlessly to cause that plan and purpose to come to pass Michelle would you bring back the verse of scripture from Philippians please Let's, let me read that to you once again being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it. And the word perform it there means he will accomplish it. He will execute it until the day of Jesus Christ. And as you can see, the picture above that is somebody making a piece of pottery. And I really and truly, I don't think that we're just occasionally on the potter's wheel. I think that in some form or fashion, as a child of God, we're always on the potter's wheel until the day that we meet our Savior and finally we're transformed into his image. So, Jeremiah chapter 18. Let me read the passage to you and then we'll go back and kind of break it down and get some perspective of it. Verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, and so he made it again another vessel, as it seemeth good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. In what instance I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning the nation and concerning a kingdom to build up and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, 
Then will I repent or change my mind of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, or I am determining evil against you and devise a device against you. Why? Because Israel was very sinful. But return ye now, everyone, from his evil way and make your ways and your plans, your doings good. So in other words, God says, if you'll turn around, if you'll change in the direction that you're going, then God says, I will change my mind towards you. And there's many examples in Scripture of God doing that. We know, the big word for it is we know that God is sovereign. What does the word sovereign mean? The word means simply sovereign, God's in control. He's supreme. So we know that God is sovereign. God said that he will accomplish his plan. God is sovereign. Yet, this passage and many other passages teach us that God in his sovereignty oftentimes reacts or responds to the choices that we make in life. Life is not nearly as much chance as it is the consequences of our choices. And so God tells them, if you continue to rebel against me, then I've got to put you on the potter's wheel. I've got to break you so that I can remake you. And God promises that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. But it's not a punishment. It's not to destroy us. It's to correct us. It's to bring us back to that place to where God can work in our life and that God can accomplish the plan and the purpose for which he has made us he is the creator and we are the created he is the creator and we're just the created so that means God is God God is in control but God is good and God wants to bless us and so he's telling the nation of Israel he's taking Jeremiah the book of Jeremiah is full of sermon illustrations, and this is one of the greatest ones. And so he takes him here down to the potter's house, and Jeremiah goes, and he watches this potter forming this vessel, and then God has a, it's a sermon illustration of the nation of Israel and God having to take them back to the potter's wheel. And God says, if you'll just turn around, if you'll just come back to me, then God says, I'll bless you. And verse 12 is one of the craziest verses in all the Bible. And they said, there is no hope. Literally, you know what the New Living Translation, you know how it translates it? Don't waste your breath. Can you imagine somebody saying to God, don't waste your breath? Yet the book of Hebrews tells us that sin hardens us or makes us stubborn. And so I know some people who at one point in time in their life have professed to be a believer, have professed to know Christ and follow Christ, yet when God wants to work in their life and God says, I'm the creator and you need to bow and submit to me so that my will can be done, we and sometimes people in essence say, don't waste your breath. But we will walk after our own devices, our own way, and we will, everyone, do the imagination of his evil heart. In other words, this is what we want to do and this is what we're going to do. Now, can you blow God off like that? Can you just say, leave me alone, don't waste your breath? And God says, well, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. No, what happens to the nation of Israel eventually? They go into Babylonian captivity. God is God. And so God had his way, and a few years after Jeremiah preaches this message to them, God allows the Babylonians to come against Jerusalem and they destroy the city and they defeat the Jews and they carry many of them away into captivity for 70 years. So there's the sermon. There's the story. God sends Jeremiah down to the potter's house. What is the potter's house? Well, you know that during the day of Jeremiah, almost all of the, the common ordinary utensils were made out of clay. Yeah, maybe some things were made out of gold or silver or wood or stone, but the common ordinary utensil vessel was made out of clay. About the only thing we have made out of clay today is it would be like this is a flower pot. But the cups, the bowls, everything pretty much was made out of clay. And to form this clay, the potter's wheel was just exactly what it sounds like. It was a wheel that this potter would take this lump of clay and he would, after he has taken this 
lump of clay through a long process of refinement. I've looked at several YouTube videos this week of the process of what it takes to get clay from the ground to where you can actually get the impurities out of it enough so that you can make something that's worth something out of it. And so after they take this clay through all of this elaborate process of trying to refine it, finally it's in a state to where the potter can take this wad of gob of clay and he literally as he begins it he actually throws it down on the wheel so that it will stick to the wheel and then he does this little pedal or something like this and it causes that wheel to spin and as the wheel spins he then begins to form and fashion this clay with the pressure from his hands and so God sends Jeremiah down to the potter's house to watch a potter make a vessel and so he's standing there and he's watching this guy make this vessel but then part of the way through this, verse 3, then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel, so he's making this cup, this bowl, I don't know what it was, and the vessel that he made with clay was marred in the hand of the potter. What does the word marred mean? It means it was defective. There was a problem with it. What was the problem? I don't know. Maybe there was still some impurity in the clay. Maybe there was some bubble in the clay. Maybe the clay was too wet. Maybe it was too dry. I don't know what it was. All I know is that as he was making it, the potter began to realize that this clay was not going to turn out to be the kind of vessel that he wanted it to be. You know, as I was thinking about this, there's, there's two factors that determine whether or not that vessel would turn out right. What are the two factors that would determine? One is the skill of the potter. I mean, if I was trying to make something out of, I've always wanted to do this, I never had the opportunity, but if I was trying to make something out of clay on the potter's wheel, everything would turn out looking like an ashtray, you know? And probably somewhere during the process, the clay and I would be down in the floor together, you know? I don't think I could do it. I would throw it off somewhere. So the skill of the potter was one thing that would determine whether or not the vessel would turn out right. And who is the potter in this passage? It's God. So do you think God has the skill? I'm sure he does. So one factor is the skill of the potter, but what's the other factor that determines whether or not this vessel turns out right? The clay. The condition of the clay. And something was wrong with this clay, and when the potter began to realize that this, this vessel was going to be defective, it was not going to be what he wanted it to be. The potter then had a, a, a serious choice to make. He could either throw the clay away and start all over again, or he could try to refine that piece of clay and still use it. You know, as I was thinking about this, some of you builders or some of you who, ladies who, who maybe make stuff, sew or whatever, you know, do you ever talk, do you ladies ever talk to the fabric or have you ever talked, you guys trying to build a house, you ever talk, and what, I don't know, like it's in, you know, it's not going to listen to you, but you fuss at it, you know. So I wonder if this potter is starting to talk to this clay. What's the matter with you today? You're just not going to cooperate, are you? And he could have thrown it away, but the Bible says, listen, he did not throw the clay away, but instead he took it and he refined it and he started to make the vessel again. There's a great old gospel song entitled, He Did Not Throw the Clay Away. Aren't you glad of that? Because you know who the clay is, don't you, in this? It's us. Aren't you glad that somewhere during the process, the potter did not say, you're just not going to cooperate, are you? Throw you away. Start with something new. No, he's been, matter of fact, the tense of all of this indicates that Jeremiah did not see the potter do this one time, but several times. Because the clay sometimes is pretty stubborn, aren't we? You know? And sometimes it is a long process for him to begin to, to fashion the clay. Something else as I've thought about as I've been studying over this this week. Sometimes when the clay is on the potter's wheel and it's being remade, sometimes the clay knows why it's being remade, right? Sometimes we know, we understand. Because we know that we have been living in a way that is not pleasing to God. And so when it happens in our life, we immediately know why this, why we're being remolded, why we're being remade, why we're being wadded back up again into a lump of clay and thrown back on there and the potter beginning to work again. We understand why that is happening. 
And the Bible says that during such times, it says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Here's one of the lessons I've had to learn as a Christian. If God says it's sin, it's sin. If God says something in my life is wrong, it is wrong. It's sin. Regardless of what popular, what public opinion, regardless of what society says, regardless of what I want to say, regardless of what even my best friend wants to say about it. If I know in my heart that it's displeasing to God, it's displeasing to God. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what the word confession means? It means to say the same thing about it that God says about it. So if God, if you know in your heart that the Holy Spirit is saying this attitude, these actions, whatever it is, you know that it's wrong, then the Bible says that you and I, the best thing we can, that's what God is telling the nation of Israel to do. God is just saying, if you will return, if you will repent, if you will come back to me, I will, I will, I will have mercy on you. I'll have grace upon you. I'll, I'll heal you. I'll bless you. But if you won't, then I have to chasten you. So sometimes when the clay is here on the pot, the potter's will, the, the clay understands why it's there. But not something else. Sometimes the clay is on the potter's will and the clay doesn't know why. Sometimes the clay is, feels like it's doing everything it possibly can to serve God. And it doesn't know why it's having to suffer. That's a hard place to be at, isn't it? Job. Remember the story of Job? The Bible says Job was a perfect and upright man, one who feared God and hated evil. God said there was no man on the face of the earth like Job. And yet, God took Job to the potter's wheel. And it's hard when a person is at that point right there. It's easy for us to sit back and tell them why they're there like Job's friends try to do you know to him and rather than helping people we destroy people sometimes with our foolish wisdom and Job's friends tried to tell Job why he was there and they didn't know why he was there No, only God and Satan knew why Job was there and Job was not there because God was punishing him Job was there because he was a righteous man and God wanted to make an even greater vessel out of him. Here's one thing that I've had to think in my own mind this week and, and pray and for me and for you. Just what kind of vessel do you want to be for the Lord? That's a, you know, what do you want to be for God? Do you want a flower pot? You know, Lord, just make me a flower pot, and that'll be great enough for me. That's a good gospel song, isn't it? Lord, make me a flower pot. I've never heard anybody come to the altar and say, Lord, just make me a flower pot. No, we don't want to be a flower pot. We want to be something that's special. So if we let, here's what I've had to process in my own mind. If we want to be that special vessel, then it's going to take a lot of time on the potter's wheel. And at first, the process is very hard, right? I would imagine, I would imagine at the beginning, the potter has to exert a lot of force on it. But as that clay, if that clay submits to the hand of the potter as he's working, the closer it gets to the end, probably the more gentle and loving the potter is working. The potter and his clay is an illustration of the potter and his children. The Apostle Paul says this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, the Bible says that if we're a child of God, if we claim, let me rephrase that, if we claim to be a child of God and we never find ourselves on the potter's wheel, or illegitimate. The Bible says that God will put all of his children at 
one point or the other on the potter's wheel because God has determined a plan and a purpose for each of our lives and God will relentlessly work to see that that come about. You know, as I think about Philippians 1, 6, there's two or three things I see out of this passage. Number one is the certainty of God's work. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work will perform it, so it will happen. Matter of fact, Peter says, don't think it's a strange thing when this fiery trial comes upon you because God is refining your faith, which is more precious than gold, is what Peter says. And so there is a certainty. God will take us and put us on the potter's wheel. Not only will God do it one time, but as I've already said, I think that it is a lifelong process. I think it is a continuation. God begins the work and God continues the work and God is very persistent in what God does. I was thinking about this one week, uh, one day this week and I actually uh, texted a couple of friends of mine in the ministry and I knew what they were going to reply when I did this, but you know, I, th- I asked them, I said, is God stubborn? And they said, well, I don't know that I would say that God is stubborn. And I thought, well, I'll tell you one thing, when God determines to do it, he's going to do it. You know, and they said, well, a better word would be God is persistent. Maybe we're stubborn and God is persistent. They're kind of two sides of the same coin, isn't it? But God is God. Is God. And he starts the process, and God is going to take us all the way through the process until God is able to accomplish what he has made each of us for. But there's something else. Philippians 1 6 tells me is that there is a completion to the work. Being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun the good work will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. You know the old saying, you know, I'm not who I should be, but praise God I'm not who I used to be. And I think I could also say I'm still not yet who I'm going to be. The the, the big biblical word for it is sanctification. We all know the word salvation. Salvation is when God saves us from our sin. The biblical word for this, the potter's will, is sanctification. What is sanctification? The word sanctification means to be, as Tracy was talking about earlier, the word holiness. The word holiness, the word sanctification comes from the word holy, actually. The word sanctification is the process God takes us through to make us holy. The word holy means to be set apart to God. And so God takes this lump of raw clay. He saves it. He redeems it. And then he puts it on his potter's wheel and he begins this process of shaping it, of molding it, of sanctifying it, of forming it into a vessel that will bring him honor and glory. Let me read two or three verses to you as I close here today. Here's one verse that I read this week. I didn't know this verse was in the Bible. And I'm actually going to put two or three translations together because I want you to understand this verse. Listen to it. Isaiah 45, 9 says this. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Woe to the pot that contends with the potter and questions whether or not he knows what he is doing. You ever had that? been tempted to do that? You ever been tempted to ask God, <laughs> what? Where are you at? Don't you? <laughs> I can't believe you do. How can you act like this? Most of you, I'm sure you're too holy to do that. But I've done that. In my mind, I've done that. Job did that. And if you haven't done that yet, probably you just haven't been in the valley yet. But it'll happen. And it's during those times that you learn that God is God. And listen, Isaiah 45, 9 says, Woe to those who contend with their maker. But then Isaiah 64, 8 says this, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So sometimes we're tempted when we're first thrown on the potter's wheel Sometimes we're tempted to question God and his goodness and his wisdom. But then as we continue to 
pray and study God's word and let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts and minds, hopefully we eventually come to the point to where we say, God, you know, there, there was a song written about it many years ago. Many years ago, there was a woman who wanted to go on the mission field to Africa. She was willing to forego being, getting married, everything here in America to go to the mission field. But the harder she tried to get on the mission field, the more the doors seemed to be closed. And the woman became so discouraged, she didn't know what to do. She went to a prayer meeting one night, and she heard somebody pray, Lord, it's all right, just as long as your will is done. And she went home, and she wrote a song. You know what the song is? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Do you know the words? Sing it. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it and stay. Why don't you stand your feet? Let's sing it. If you want to come and pray, come and pray. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord. Wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord. Wounded and weary. Help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior dear.